Hey guys, welcome to Tactical. Today we're going to do another episode of Compunomics and talk about the secondary market of CPUs. In particular, we're going to be tackling a very interesting question. Now you've seen a lot of talk about whether or not now is the time to upgrade from that Sandy Bridge i5 or i7. And a lot of people have gone to great lengths to prove that Skylake is in fact the time for those people to move ahead and move on. But one question that hasn't been addressed is whether or not it's a good idea to buy a Sandy Bridge i5 or i7 from scratch as opposed to a Skylake i7 or i5. And I'm here to show you today, complete with graphs and charts and more numbers, why buying used might be advantageous for anyone looking to build a new system. Period. So if that didn't convince you, wait until you see the numbers. <laughs> All right, let's jump right in here. First stat we have to explain and describe, of course, is raw price and normalized as a percentage. $339 US is the Skylake i7 MSRP, and we're going to use that as our base comparison for everything beneath it. Broadwell is a bit of an oddity. I would like you to ignore it from this point on because it was actually MSRP'd higher due to that ED RAM chip that was on it that acted like an L4 cache and there weren't any for sale on eBay or maybe there was like one uh, so it's not a large enough sample size to even consider and nobody fucking bought it nobody cares anyway so focus on the ones that end in a K and fuck the C i7-6700K of course comes in at a 100% price ratio which each of the CPUs and their used prices falling beneath it how did I get these used conglomerate prices? Well, I simply took the completed eBay auctions of the corresponding type, added them up, and divided them among the number of samples I was able to collect. Simple as that. These prices do not include shipping, but I assure you shipping is usually between $0 and $12 and does not really affect the end result and the point I am trying to prove. So, that's how we got price. Performance. Also, equally simple. We took Cinebench R15, we took a per 100 megahertz score, and we normalized that as a ratio of 100 to the Skylake CPU across all the generations underneath it. As you can see, there is a 24% performance variance between Sandy and Skylake in terms of multi-thread Cinebench R15, and the price much wider varying as this chart will demonstrate. So at this point it should be painfully obvious to anyone with a brain that the better price performer is going to be the Sandy Bridge i7, but there are a couple of points that I want to make before we move on. Enthusiasts for one don't give a shit about price performance. They are paying the early adopter tax for a reason and they are fully willing to pay it. They just want the best that they can get. Therefore this one-to-one -one price performance ratio that the 6700K offers and the peace of mind that it brings is something they are willing to pay a premium for, just as they were willing to pay a premium for it five years ago when the Sandy Bridge i7 was all the shit. Secondly, you have to be comfortable with a shorter warranty period if you buy used. Sandy Bridge is almost certainly, unless you have a receipt to prove that you bought it sooner, out of warranty. Ivy Bridge is right on the border, most of them are still covered. Haswell's still good for a little while longer. Broadwell, who gives a fuck. And of course, Skylake is brand new. Keep in mind that of the hundreds and hundreds of CPUs that I have owned in my lifetime, less than 1% have been bad when they reached my hands. And that includes CPUs that were much, much older than Sandy Bridge i7s. Last but not least, I would like to point out to all the people who hate the fact that I use Cinebench as my base metric here, that gaming performance, the variance between the 6700K and the 2600K, is actually considerably smaller. If you would take a minute to watch the hardware unboxed video or read the PC per article where they compare all generations of i7 against each other in gaming performance, you will see that the variance from top to bottom is actually about 14 points as opposed to the 24 points you see here in Cinebench performance. So if you are getting an i7 solely for gaming and you want to take advantage of all that multi-thread optimization that's taking place now with DirectX 12 and so on, the i7-2600K is going to have serious fucking legs and will only be at most 14 points back of the 6700K in the overwhelming majority of games. That includes the CPU intensive titles like Witcher 3, Fallout 4, GTA 5, anything open world that has a lot of draw calls and a lot of draw distance. Moving on to i5s here, you will see that the difference in performance and price performance is much the same with a few minor exceptions. 
The i5-2500K as a comparison to the 6600K seems to hold up better. That probably has something to do with the fact that the i7s are relying on hyperthreading for half of their score. In any event, the story is very much the same, with one key exception. Let's go back to the i7 chart for a minute and I'll address that now. Now you might have noticed that the i7-4770K is actually cheaper than the 3770K. And this is because it got a bad reputation for having shitty thermal interface material between the heat spreader and the die itself, which caused an elevation in temperatures and limited overclockability. This is true, but that same thermal interface material actually was used in the Ivy Bridge i7s as well. The only difference is it didn't really limit overclockability to the same extent, so it wasn't as big of a deal, but as a result, 4770Ks are not preferred, uh, especially if you can get a 4790K. But for people like us, this is quite the deal. And as long as you don't plan any extreme overclocking, you can still get these guys up to 4.5, 4.6 gigahertz on around 1.3 to 1.35 volts, and you'll be perfectly happy. The only difference is your temperatures are, of course, going to be a touch higher than they would be on the 4790K. But those of us who are just looking to get below the TJ Maxx and live comfortably are going to have no problems with a 4770K. So take advantage of that price dip because it is well worth it if you are pursuing Haswell. The only other detractor between both generations with buying used is that, of course, you have to find a corresponding motherboard. Z68, P67 motherboards, and Z77 motherboards, Z75, all those chipsets that will house Sandy and Ivy Bridge and allow them to be overclockable are becoming increasingly rare, but you can still obtain them for as low as $40 to $50 Canadian up here in Toronto, and I'm assuming it's much the same in the United States, so you should have no troubles there. As for Haswell motherboards like the Z87 and Z97 chipset, of course they are still sold in stores to this day brand new. Of course we're getting down to overstock now, but the bottom line is there's still a lot of pickings to be had and there should be no problems picking up one to go with the given CPU you happen to pick up. And of course Broadwell doesn't count, so fuck it. Biggest point I want to make here. For enthusiasts, obviously, this doesn't mean shit all and you should disregard this video completely. This data is for people who are on a limited budget and want to get the most out of the computer they're building. Bottom line is CPU technology has progressed very slowly over the last five years, as evident with how well the i7-2600K and i5-2500K still perform today. So if you are looking to save 150 to 200 US dollars on your build and you're on a limited budget, getting the weaker CPU with the older architecture is a great way to put extra money into your GPU, which is often the more critical component, and get more out of your system as a whole. Anyway, to close it out, we're going to take a look at AMD processors here. <laughs> no, not even, of course not. All right, I apologize for my little AMD joke there. You know, it was all in good jest. I actually owned AMD processors in my personal builds for the majority of my life up until about four or five years ago. So really, I'm not knocking them. And you know how I feel about AMD processors. I think the Phenom 2 series is still a great way to go for a low-end budget build. The FX processors, of course, not been doing so well, but we're gonna cover those in a different video because there is actually still some great value to be had there, but it requires a video of its own, so stay tuned for that. Anyway, I think that pretty much makes this one a video. So what I want you to do this time, if you wouldn't mind, is in the comments, leave me a suggestion as for what you'd like me to cover next. Are there any questions that you have really wanted to know the answer to about buying used in the secondary market? I'd be happy to answer. I have a wealth of data at my disposal and 15 years of experience. Please do not be shy. Let me know what you would like to see and I'd be happy to oblige. And of course, follow me on Twitter at Ofa. I'm Ofa on Reddit as well. You can hit me up there if you have any questions. I'll do my best to answer them. Can't necessarily get to them all, but I will get to as many as I can. And the girlfriend's home, so I gotta go. So make the one a video. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.